Ask a Priest Live, guided by the Holy Spirit and honoring the magisterial teachings of the Church. Faithful Catholic priests answering questions for believers and those seeking truth. Ask a Priest, because Father knows best. And now, your guest host, Angela Erickson. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Angela Erickson, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys today for this show, Ask a Priest Live. This is my second time hosting this show, and I'm really excited about it. Um, and we have so many great, great questions today. I think I think you guys are going to get a lot from this this particular episode, this show today. Um, and if you are wanting to call and ask your questions, this show is for you. So we want you to come in. We want you to call in. We want you, we want you to send your emails. And if you're wondering where and how you can do that, you can give us a call at 877-511-5483. Or you can email us at priest at the station of the cross.com and we'll be here to take your questions we're also in the live chat on youtube um, and i believe you can watch this even on rumble and on you can also listen to it on the iCatholic radio app so lots of ways you can access this show you don't want to miss it and we have a wonderful wonderful guest today um, we're actually going to be talking to canon luke Zignego. He is um, a member of the uh, Institute of Christ the King. He serves as the chaplain of St. Joseph Oratory in the Diocese of Gary, Indiana. And he was ordained in 2018. Thank you so much, Cannon, for coming on today. It's such a joy to be able to talk to you about all these really great questions today. Thank you, Angela. It's good to be here. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. And how, how are things down in Gary, Indiana? I know different parts of the country have had some really weird weather episodes lately. How is it down there? Uh, it's, uh, well, I'm looking outside in my room in Chicago right now, and it was a little sunnier earlier, now a little overcast, but uh, the weather is pretty, it's been warming up. Uh, spring is definitely well on its way here. That's so nice. And and I'm from Minnesota. So I like, that's what we do. We have to ask everyone what the weather is like because the weather is so unpredictable, especially this time of year. Sorry. It just, the Minnesotan just, it just oozes out of me. So I apologize if that, uh, if, if that seems uh, a little unusual for you, but get used to it. We're going to be talking about hot dishes and casseroles here all week. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. I'm, let's I'm from Wisconsin get... originally. So I think, you know. uh, I think I'm going to have to bite my tongue a little bit to make it through this, the, uh, the show, but I think we can do it. <laughs> oh, oh, are we going to, are we going to start the battle on the Packers and the Vikings and who, who's really who? I mean, fair well, enough. I mean, you guys are way better we than can, us. We so. can, we'll just let the record talk for itself. <laughs> it does. It really, it does speak for itself. We'll, oh, we'll see you in the so fall. Great. We'll see you in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great. Okay. Well, we have some Let's maybe get started with our first email from Anonymous. This one is for you. Um, hello, Canon. Could you explain in general what is appropriate attire for women to wear who do factory and farm work? Are jeans and pants ever allowed? Are women supposed to wear skirts and dresses all the time, no matter what they're doing? What do you think? I think this is a great question because I've just noticed as a woman this this question about modesty, this modesty discourse, it just never seems to die because there's not enough clarity on it. So what what do you say about this, this question of women and what they should wear? And, and does it vary depending on the kind of work that they're doing? Yeah, so obviously this is a very um, hot button, but I would also say important topic, especially for our time, our time which has lost, uh, among other things, the sense of the virtue of modesty and what it means. So, uh, you know, we could do a whole show just on this question, explaining why it's important, what is appropriate, what's not appropriate and all that. But I think uh, just to give kind of a general, uh, a general answer to this, I would say, well, first of all, we live in times when uh, women spend more time out, uh, you know, in the workplace, out, um, in uh, particular vocations or or occupations, I should say, that in years past, even 50 or especially 100 years ago, uh, never never would have happened. And you know, we can comment on 
how that's not necessarily a good thing because of the taking of the, the woman out of the home where she accomplishes the best good she can do, which is the raising of future generations, that special God-given vocation that only she can fulfill. Men can't do that uh, by themselves, of course, being parents is a, is, a, is, a, is a team. God created both man and woman. To, a child needs a mother and a father, but the woman you know, has that first uh, uh, kind of uh, impression upon the child and even she, she knows how to educate the child in those first instances. In any case, you know, women still find themselves, uh, not necessarily through their fault, in these occupations outside of the home. So then what is appropriate attire? Well, first, I think the first principle we have to understand is that um, men and women are different, right? And so our whole society is striving to tell us that they are not, that they are the same, they are interchangeable. But clearly anyone with uh, two eyes, two ears, or who has passed any amount of time in the presence of the other gender, no, that's that's not the case. We are different, right? Different and complementary. Um, just as God intended. So there are also then clothes that are different. Men and women are different. And also how we perceive clothes and how we perceive uh, the body is different. And um, and so those things should reflect that. Now, Pius XII tells us that the three, uh, the three um, kind of functions of clothing are uh, concealment, adornment, and hygienic. So concealment, obviously, since the fall, you know, if we look in the, in, uh, the book of Genesis, after the fall, Adam and Eve, because their passions were no longer perfectly subject to their reason and will, they were put and uh, thrust into disorder and disarray by uh, the disorder that entered their souls by uh, rejecting God in original sin. Uh, so they're no longer under their control. So then they felt ashamed. Before they didn't feel ashamed because they had their their passions uh, and their uh, their lower uh, movements of the flesh were perfectly subject to their reason. Uh, afterwards, they were not, and so they felt ashamed. That's where that uh, that sort of that uh, affliction, we can say, came from. And so since the fall, it is necessary to conceal ourselves because each one of us, every single um, human, human uh, excluding, of course, our Savior uh, and his blessed mother, was conceived in original sin, right? And uh, we, all, we all live with it and with those uh, fallen tendencies. And so because of that, Clothing is necessary for concealment. Uh, secondly, adornment. So the human body is also, we can't forget this, the, the height of material creation, right? It is a beautiful, um, a wondrous thing. We are wondrously made, we read in scriptures. And so uh, it is, um, uh, there's also a need to adorn the body. I mean, uh, Pius XII also says uh, that need is felt more acutely by the woman uh, because, you know, the man is drawn to the beauty of the woman. That's just how our, how our nature is uh, attracted. And so there's a, a certain acceptable uh, uh, um, element of clothing uh, or of choosing clothing that is adornment. So it is good to adorn uh, the human body and dress in beautiful things, right? Um and uh, the last is hygienic, right? Is more of a practical purpose, which is, you know, we need to, uh, we need to, you know, dress according to the weather, right? We're not going to uh, wear a, a tank top in the Arctic, and we're not going to wear uh, a parka in the, you know, a fur parka in the tropics, right? It's uh, dress according to both the exterior, um, but also um, according to the. Um, the function of what we are doing. So that kind of brings us to then, uh, sorry for that long introduction, but it brings us a little bit to this. So the appropriate attire for women who, to wear who do factory work and farm work. First of all, I would say, obviously there can be exceptions, but I would say factory work isn't necessarily something that a woman should seek to have um, because it's particularly um, uh, uh, physical and uh, demanding. Um, also, you're gonna be with, uh, in the company of men who are perhaps a little bit cruder. Now that doesn't excuse them, right? Um, but it, it doesn't seem like the ideal place for a woman to be. So I would say that perhaps she should seek uh, employment, gainful employment elsewhere, where it might be a little bit more conducive to um, to her, you know, dignity uh, as a woman. Now, uh, farm work. Now that's a little bit different because obviously farm is more of a family, and a woman, you know, can't just uh, not help her 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 husband or family or father out there. There's uh, you know obviously things that she can she can do uh, on on the farm, and you know sometimes it's necessary to pitch in here and there. And so I would say yes. I mean, in that 
in that situation, are jeans pants allowed? Uh, you know, on the one hand, there's a difference in clothing between men and women, men and women. On the other hand, there certainly are uh, uh, are situations in which that uh, sort of more practical clothing is necessary. Now, here, here's what I would say. Uh, I like to leave a little bit of freedom, you know, up to up to the woman, depending on where she's at. Some women, they'll never wear pants, and I commend them for that. It is certainly more feminine and more womanly to wear uh, a skirt. It is certainly more appropriate. Afterwards, um, maybe not every woman is perhaps at that point, at that point. It's something to strive for, um, but they're perhaps at, at that point. And so, you know, you could still, for example, if you're working in the, the field and hay, hay baling and helping out with that uh, because it, it is necessary, then, I, you know, I don't think um, that it's necessarily inappropriate for her to, uh, to, to wear that. That being said, I think, I think you can wear, I think you can wear uh, a skirts uh, for a lot more than you would think is practical. I walk around yeah. in a full-length robe, a cassock, uh, all day long, and I'm able to accomplish quite a few tasks. You know, um, from anything from you know my my normal uh, priestly tasks, which of course don't aren't necessarily a challenge, uh, but things things like doing sports or even working and uh, walking around, it's not that impossible. You yeah. have to be a little bit slower, a little bit more attentive. So I think that there Thank is you. that. Thank you so much, Ken. We're going to have, have to leave it there because we're coming up on a hard break. Please call 877-511-5483. We'll talk to you on the other side. And uh, yeah, we have a lot to discuss. Way more homosexuality, uh, sports on Sundays, and so much more. Stay tuned. The Station of the Cross is brought to you in part by My Catholic Will. This Lent, consider making an act of charity by including the Station of the Cross in your will. We've partnered with My Catholic Will to make it easy and convenient to create your will, and it's free. Just use referral code 14 stations when you visit mycatholicwill.com forward slash the Station of the Cross. Again, that's mycatholicwill.com forward slash the Station of the Cross. The month of February is dedicated to the Holy Family. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless our family. Open our hearts to receive your love. May our home be another Nazareth, so that our family may be a place where your peace and love abides. Open our eyes to recognize the gift and beauty of life, so that we may find joy in your presence among us. Grant us pure hearts seeking holiness, generous hearts full of your love, merciful hearts ready to forgive, and tender hearts full of kindness. May our family be a sanctuary of life and love, a beacon of hope, drawing others to your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Holy Family of Nazareth, pray for us. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. You're listening to Ask a Priest Live from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Have a question? Ask a priest. Call 1-877-511-5483 or email us at priests at thestationofthecross.com. Live. My name is Angela Erickson, and we're sitting down today with Canon Zignago to answer your questions. Um, whatever your questions might be right now, maybe you're struggling with the faith right now, or maybe you're having a problem with someone in your family that maybe is struggling in their faith. Um, whatever it might be, whatever you're struggling with right now, whatever questions you have about the church and her teachings, 
we're here to help you get that answer that you're looking for. And so first, we actually have a call from Molly uh, in Ontario, Canada. She has a question about Psalm 109. Molly, what is your question for Canon here today? I'm so sorry. Can you hear that? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, now I can hear you, Molly. I heard a little bit of background noise and I wasn't sure if if I was the only one having a hard time hearing you. But if you if you speak up nice and clear, we should be able to get your question from you about Psalm 109. Okay. sorry. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering who is being referred to in Psalm 109? Like, is it a reference to Jesus or someone else like King David? And um, could you maybe just explain what the psalm means a little bit more? Like, I know it's prayed at Vespers on Sunday. Hello, Molly. Thank you for your question. So, yes, Psalm 109, which is obviously the first um, psalm of Vespers on Sundays and on feasts, at least uh, uh, traditionally, uh, sung and it's a very messianic psalm. That is to say, it specifically refers to our Lord. Now, like all the psalms, the majority of which were written by David, um, some by Solomon and, and and others, but all of the psalms refer in some capacity, like the entirety of the Old Testament, to our Lord. It's pointing towards Him as the Messiah to come. Now, they were all written in a historical context and can refer to particular trials or struggles that the individual author was going through at the time, but through him, uh, who wrote down those words, inspired by the Holy Spirit, our Lord also speaks. And so it can at the both time, both at the same time refer to David and to our Lord, more specifically, uh, more finally, I should say, or more, um, uh, yeah, with a, an aspect of finality, uh, more principally to Jesus Christ himself. And so let's look at the psalm a little bit. So the first is, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So our Lord quotes the psalm also too in the New Testament. And he's, he, you know, uh, when the uh, Pharisees and the scribes come to him and are trying to trip him up with their words, uh, he, he sends them back uh, with this. He says, uh, if the Messiah, who they were expecting, is the son of David, which, you know, he was uh, prophesied to be. How, why does he say the Lord's, or why does David say the Lord said to my Lord, and my Lord was always referred to as the Messiah here, sit thou at right, my right hand. And so uh, our Lord says, why does, why is David calling his descendant his Lord? Because the one who comes before is greater in a certain sense. Why is he calling him? And they couldn't answer him, of course, because it only makes sense if it is, you know, in the, in the uh, context of our Christian religion, which is that uh, Jesus Christ, the son of David, is God made man. And so that's what uh, is being referred to in the first verse there. The second fourth is the Lord will send forth the scepter of thy power out of Sion, rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. So that, of course, more more reference to the scepter of thy power, which is um, uh, Christ ruling over uh, both the chosen people out of Sion, because of which he is the um, the reason for, right, our Lord, the chosen people is chosen to prepare the world for the coming of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies, that is to say, both uh, essentially the the demons, but also those evil men who do not accept Christ. Uh, with thee is principality in the day of thy strength, uh, in the brightness of the saints, from the womb before the day star I begot thee. And so this last part, uh, from the womb before the day star I begot thee, is both uh, the day star, that is to say the, the sun, right? The sun is the day star. So before the creation he was begotten. And that refers, of course, to the eternal generation of uh, the Son from the Father. The Father uh, begets the Son eternally from all time. It is continual action. So, um, uh, from all eternity, part of the mystery of the Holy Trinity as that is expressed there. And this is actually um, uh, the verse, or part of the verse that's taken. Uh, that's used for the introit of Midnight Mass at Christmas, right? Midnight Mass at Christmas, which is the celebration of the fact that Christ is begotten in time of the Virgin Mother, uh, but he's also begotten eternally. So it talks about this birth of Christ, uh, both 
uh, as the second person of the Blessed Trinity, divinely from all time from the Father, and then his uh, begetting according to the flesh in our human nature uh, of the Blessed Virgin at that particular moment in uh, Bethlehem of Judah. Uh, some 2,000 years ago. The next verse says, The Lord has sworn and he will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so here uh, we understand who our Lord is, um, both God and man. He has come to be a priest, a priest or a high priest in Latin is pontifex, bridge builder, because he builds that bridge between both God and man. Being both God and man, he reconciles sinful man to God by his sacrifice. According to the order of Melchizedek, well, Melchizedek is this mysterious personage in the Old Testament in uh, Genesis who appears uh, somewhat out of nowhere. His name, it, he's the king of Salem, king of Salem, meaning peace. He's the prince of peace. So obviously that refers to our Lord, who is also called the prince of peace. Uh, he offers sacrifice uh, for uh, Abraham after the victory of Abraham over the five kings. Abraham had to fight uh, these five kings when he came um Near the, near the promised land, had to fight a battle, and so he offers thanks. And Abraham has him offer thanks for him. And he offers thanks. Abraham gives him tithes. Um, you know, that's where the tithing one-tenth comes from. Uh, and Abraham, uh, Melchizedek offers, offers a sacrifice of bread and wine, which is very interesting as well. And so he comes, and then Melchizedek disappears, and he goes, and we never hear from him again, at least his, uh, his person. Uh, and there's a lot, little bit more that could be said there, but uh, the Lord at thy right hand hath broken the kings in the day of his wrath. Again, the kings here refer to especially uh, those who resist the reign of Christ, uh, specifically the demons, right, who are the princes of this world in a certain sense, uh, but also all those men who... Um, uh, all those men, uh, sinful men who resist uh, Christ's power, especially, you know, those who have political power here below who resist the, the empire of, of Christ. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill ruins. He shall crush the heads in the land of many. Again, that great uh, kind of uh, militaristic and victorious and uh, kingly terms that are used there. Christ shall judge us all as the king. He shall drink of the torrent in the way, therefore shall he lift up his head. So this one, uh, the fathers, or I think I think it was maybe St. Robert Bellarmine, I forget exactly who said it, I'm sorry, but talks about the torrent in the way. He says that's of our humanity, our humanity which is constantly changing as a river which moves and passes by. And so Christ, uh, the second person of the divine trinity, unchangeable in his divinity, drinks of the torrent of our changeable humanity when he became man, and therefore he shall lift up his head, that is to say, he is made the head of us all, not only as he is God, but also as man. So there's a little a little exegesis, so hopefully that helps you, gives you, there's a lot more to be said. I would recommend uh, St. Robert Bellarmine has a commentary on all the Psalms. You can go to any of the fathers and see what they say, especially St. Augustine, um, St. John Chrysostom, they write about the Psalms. There's a lot more uh, to be to be uh, discovered there. Uh, don't take my word for it. Go go see what the saints say. Well, thank you so much for that answer. That was really amazing. You're very welcome. God bless. Thank you. Thank you for calling in, Molly. Wow, that was a very thorough exegesis for, for a radio show like this. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think we all probably benefited a great deal from that. Um, let's well, see here. A, so. A, that's an easy one yeah. to uh, that's an easy one to uh, do an exegesis on. So if she had picked another one. It might have been a little harder. That one we studied a little <laughs> bit more because we pray it all the time. So um, I'm glad I'm glad she asked about that one. That is so beautiful. Yeah, I, we we do have a couple more callers, and and we're probably coming up um, here soon on the next break. But maybe we can quick squeeze in Kenrick from Ontario, Canada. He's a first time caller and he has a question about predestination and vocations. Uh, maybe just give a couple of, maybe make this as concise as possible so that father or Canon can give you a really concise answer as well. Okay. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Oh yes. Thank you. Yep. There you are. You're perfect. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> So I have a question regarding the predestination and canons uh, uh, and vocations regarding uh, utilizing Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. And Psalm 110, the one uh, you guys just went over, you were a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And Matthew 10, 37 to 38, um, which is, well, 
Oh, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So I just have a question regarding the first two, and then uh, I'll cover the uh, the Matthew part later. Go ahead. Uh, What's your question so, specifically? Yeah, so I'm just asking, like, so, like, uh, like during callings, right, uh, we're called to be, you know, priest, prophet, and king, but for um, to be like an ordained priest, uh, a, you require a calling from God. And I'm confused about like um, like predestination, right? Because wouldn't this like eliminate our free will if we were like forced to be a priest like from the beginning? But it, like uh, like I'm like I'm just confused on that because uh, like I'm trying to like, conform my will to God's will. So yeah. Okay, well, thank you for the question. So I think that um, I would respond by saying that um, God's God's choice does never excludes our free will. And so, for example, the Blessed Mother, who always participated perfectly with God's plan for her, said uh, yes to him. Uh, but his plan, simply because he had the plan for her, did not force her free will. His gift of this vocation as mother of God did not force her. He still depended on her saying yes. And simply because he foresees that the person will say yes and then makes his plan in light of that, that doesn't force the free will, right? Foreknowledge is not causality, right? God's foreknowledge is not the causality of our free will. Rather, what moves our free will is, of course, his grace, but also that independence on our part, that freedom on our part. So that's how we have to understand, I think, uh, our relation of, of God's foreknowledge towards uh his providing the graces and what we need and, and, and it all working into his plan. Simply because God knows everything that's going to happen and can thus make a plan, it doesn't oblige us. It doesn't oblige uh, the, the, the created wills, those of angels and humans, right? Which, which are the contingents, which are the, um, uh, the uh, sort of um, the factors that are unknown in a certain sense, uh, doesn't oblige those to then do what they do do. So I think that's important uh, to understand that God's foreknowledge isn't uh, what causes um, our uh, our choices, our cooperation with grace or not, right? We're not puppets. Christ, uh, God chooses us, gives us freedom. We are freely acting agents uh, who hopefully cooperate with his grace. Well, we're going to have to put a pause on that until we come back on the other side of this break here. Uh, a great question from Kenrick about predestination and vocations. What about our free will? And uh, we're going to answer the other half question regarding Matthew 10 on the other side. If you are interested in calling us, please give us a call at 877-511-5483 so that Canon can ask your questions today. See you on the other side. In 1937, 20 years after Our Lady appeared in Fatima, Pope Pius XI wrote the encyclical on atheistic communism, precisely to warn the faithful about Russia's errors. Pope Pius XI, quote, atheistic communism aims at upsetting the social order and undermining the very foundations of Christian civilization. For the first time in history, we are witnessing a struggle, cold-blooded in purpose and mapped out to the least detail between man and all that is called God, close quote. Now that is really interesting. Because right there, the Pope is quoting from 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. That's the section that St. Paul is writing about, the Antichrist. This satanic scourge is in opposition both to reason and to divine revelation. Entire peoples find themselves in danger of falling back into a barbarism worse than that which oppressed the greater part of the world at the coming of the Redeemer. Well, look around. Here we are. That's Sermons for Everyday Living from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. This is Father Anthony Amato from the Diocese of Rochester, New York. Please join me in praying the Anima Christi prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from you. From the wicked foe, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me and bid me to come to you 
that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Did you know that live video of the show is just a few clicks away? Follow us on Facebook and YouTube at Ask a Priest Live. Search for the Station of the Cross on Rumble. Or check out our Watch Live page at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back to Ask a Priest Live. My name is Angela Erickson. I am your guest host today, and I'm sitting down with Canon Zignego, excuse me, and he is answering a question right now. But before we go back to Kendrick uh, from Ontario, Canada, I would like to take a moment to just ask you, do you have your will completed yet? Have you done that? That's pretty important stuff. Um, life is too short to uh, leave anything up to chance because we are not promised tomorrow. So uh, if you don't have a will, consider going to mycatholicwill.com. They are a sponsor of this show um, and we're so grateful for them. You can go to mycatholicwill.com backslash the station of the cross to get your will made up for free. And if you use the promo code 14 stations, 14 stations, that's, that's going to get it for, to you for free. So um, please visit mycatholicwill.com. Now, Kenrick, I want to return to your question and make sure that Canon Zignago can answer it. Uh, would you mind explaining your question regarding Matthew 10 verses 37 through 38 and so that he can sort of address that portion for you? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like Matthew 10 part just slipped down. Um, oh. But <laughs> yes. Yeah, because yeah, um, like um, my parents, like they're uh, hesitant to support the vocation discernment to say the least. Because so, I'm an only child, so. Oh yeah, that's a big sacrifice for them. Uh, do you have any advice, yeah, maybe? The glory of God, you know. Amen. Yeah, maybe Canon has some advice for you then. <laughs> what to do in this situation for discernment? Yeah, I've already. Oh uh, yes, well. To, like... Sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Matthew. Go ahead. All right. Well, I would say that. Um, you know, the, obviously those words that our Lord says, you know, he who comes to me and does not hate uh, father and mother, brother and sister, uh, uh, and, you know, to, in order to, to serve me, those words can seem kind of harsh. And what our Lord is saying is not actual hatred, but he's opposing it to the love of him. And he says that when our love of our family can prove to be an obstacle to our love of God, then it is bad. So he's saying, all the loves in our lives, whatever might be in our lives, especially people, you know, uh, things that we possess, whatever it might be, uh, it becomes an evil love when it's opposed to the love of God. And so they should all be at the service of the love of God. And, you know, ideally they can. Ideally they can, right? Uh, we can use the things that we have to serve God rather or by helping others, by fulfilling faithfully the duties of our state. Um, the love that we have for our friends and especially our family can lead to us First of all, giving them a good example. Secondly, um, showing them compassion and love uh, in our own lives, uh, being open uh, to, to helping them when they ask for need, um, leading them uh, to Christ. Uh, and so those loves do not have to be opposed, but if they are, if we put the one in front of the other, that is to say the created love in front of the uncreated love, uh, that is where the issue comes in. And so that's what our Lord is saying. Also, as you mentioned, it can be also this understanding that this respect or uh, natural filial uh, affection that we owe to our parents should not come between uh, ourselves and what God has ordained for us, his plan for us. And so, you know, certainly you've said that you are uh, discerning in your own life, um, you know, <clears throat> the uh, advice and opinion of your parents is something that is important that you should take into account. Um, you know, they know you, they know you well, but if they're coming from, it, it depends if they're coming from, you know, sort of uh, human considerations or divine considerations. Do they, um, do they believe as you do? 
very good. If so, very good. Um, but do they consider, you know, having uh, grandchildren as more important than having spiritual grandchildren, right? Because, of course, what God has called you to, whatever that might be, and again, you aren't uh, deciding what your vocation is now. You're just being open to discerning. And I think for that peace of soul, um, you can uh, uh, and you should and you will need to uh, at least be open to what God wants. And so on your side, you have to be both respectful of your parents, um, not rebellious, but also uh, you have to follow God's will where that might be for you. So pray for guidance. You know, I would encourage you if you don't have a spiritual director to obtain one uh, who's able to guide you kind of through this. Um, offer you advice through all of this, um, help you to understand, you know, both the filial respect and obedience that you owe to your parents and will always owe to them, but also uh, to discern what God is calling you uh, to do. And also do not, um, you know, be, uh, do not be discouraged. Many, um, many have faced opposition in their discerning of a vocation, whatever that might be. Um, but uh, with God's uh, grace and with his perseverance, you'll be able to, first of all, to discern if that's really what you're called to, and then also to help your, your parents kind of understand the beauty that is in a religious vocation. Certainly there are sacrifices not only for um, the priest or the religious uh, uh, brother or sister, but also uh, for the family that are involved, right, uh, of giving up their child and not being able to see their child as much anymore of him, you know, giving up the, the grandchildren. But there are many grace is that and blessings too even that come from uh from ac accepting that as well and so uh, you know i can assure you uh, of my prayers and of my encouragement um and you know don't let this uh trial um become a source of uh anger for you on your side, but rather uh, you can firmly let yet gently hold the line uh, and continue your discernment. But I would, yeah, I would advise you to, you know, really, uh, if you haven't already to find a spiritual director, just a, a single one that you trust, you can follow uh, and you can stick with and who can guide you through this. Thanks, Kenrick, for hanging on the line for that. And uh, feel free to give us a call back anytime if you have any more questions for him uh, following up or maybe other obstacles that come in the way or, or whatever comes to mind while you're discerning, um, discerning a vocation into the priesthood. And I, I just, if you're listening to this right now, please pray for Kenrick in Ontario, Canada. Thanks, Kenrick, for calling, calling the program. Now we're gonna to move to another call. We have a call from Aaron in Dallas, Texas. He has a question about obligations and whether any priest has the power to lower them or only certain priests in certain scenarios. I'd like to, to kind of flesh that question out a little bit more. Uh, Aaron, welcome to the program. Hello, my question for Canon is, well, I'm doing, this, I'm doing this for a friend, but he says he's a welder, he works a nine to five and for him, he finds it difficult to say the, the little office. And because of those situations for him, him being a blue call, a blue collar worker and his schedule where he wakes up at five and goes to sleep early, he can't say the traditional office. And so in that case, because me and him are, enroll, are invested in the scapular, can any priest, albeit Noah's Ordo or traditionalist, lower down the obligation for him or does he have to go to the priest that enrolled him in the scapular and if so what can you recommend for him if you i don't know if this can work through this through this uh means that you can lower it for him or does he have to go to or, or can you go to any priest that's hello a uh aaron thank you that's a very good question i i have to uh, admit, I'm not sure. I know that the priest who imposes the scapular can uh, commute the office or the the uh, the requirement from the little office to usually what we do is you know if it's a if it's a child it's at least a couple hail marys per day or if it's an adult the holy rosary the daily holy rosary um, uh, to uh, fulfill that. But um, as far as if he's never had it uh, commuted. Um, I think that uh, I would think, again, don't quote me on it, but I would think that any priest uh, could do that. Um, but I will have to, I will have to um, check 
uh, the obligations. Um, I don't want to say any priest can and then and then be wrong, but that would be my my inclination towards my understanding. I'm sorry that I don't have a more um, uh, sure, I would say certain answer or definite answer on that. Uh, so I would have to look into that. So my apologies for not being able to to give you a definite answer on that, but I don't want to commit to one and 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 be be an error. But my inclination would be to say I think that it is any priest who could uh, commute that you know for him from the little office to the holy rosary, um, or or something like that. So my apologies for um, not knowing. Uh, because I got mine commuted commuted because of my apostle going rosary where we have a. A Carmelite priest in high in, in the actual Carmel who lowered it for us to our our assigned decade, and mm-hmm. if I managed yep. to convince him to join my apostolate, would that work for him, or or would he still have to tell uh, the priest who enrolled us our situ- his situation primarily? Did you get enrolled by this Carmelite priest? Uh, no, Father. I was enrolled uh, in in the S- in the S- SSP of Dallas. Yeah. Well, I would think then that that would work with the Carmelite priest. I mean, really, it used to be only the Carmelite priests, and now, you know, for some time it has been any priest can enroll in the scapular. Um, so I, I think that would be fine. Again, I, yeah, that sounds correct to me, but with the reservation that I don't have an absolute certainty, I would need to to check that, but I, it sounds good to me. I mean, you could probably ask the Carmelite priest too, you know, Father, this is the situation we're in, uh, and, and hopefully he would... You know, because it is a participation in the um, uh, the merits of the uh, of the third order uh, of the of, of the ent- or the entire Carmelite order. It's basically being enrolled in the third order as a Carmelite. Um, he would hopefully have a more certain response for that. But again, my apologies for that. I I think I would say it seems to me yes, but that's as sure of an answer as I can give. Sorry. And also, my before I go, Father, uh, sure. I'm sure okay. I was going to say. Since he's not saying the little office, is he still in, entitled to the Sabbatine privilege, or does, or or does he not uh, enjoy that privilege? That's my that's my other question because he's not saying part. Since he's not fulfilling it, I mean he has a, 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 a justified reason. Does that mean he's he's not going to get the graces, or does he still get the graces? Uh, well, I it would be hard for me to say yes if that he is fulfilling it if he's not fulfilling the obligation and doesn't have a quote unquote dispensation. Um, but I would think that he could get that commuted rather, uh, you know, rather, um, uh, I'm sorry, rather easily. So uh, I would simply talk to that Carmelite priest or talk to uh, another priest down there. Um, and I think that they can change that. So then he would, but currently, uh, I mean, the only way to find out is to die and go see Our Lady. But um, don't, don't recommend that, doing that on purpose. Yeah, we don't. We're not recommend doing that. So, um, so I would say that I think he should just, you know, work on getting commuted to a to a, Mar- a different Marian devotion, um, and then he'll be sure of be, of fulfilling it. Or, or could he just say, you know, a lot of vespers, or no? I mean, that's better than nothing, but it's hard for me to say that that's it because he can't, I don't know if he can, uh, you know, if he says that with the intention of fulfilling his obligation and that's all he can, if that's all he can say, that's better than not doing it. But it's hard for me to say, yes, he is thereby uh, dispensed from that if if he was given the, you know, the the obligation, right? If he was given the particular obligation to fulfill, um, he would need a priest, you know, to kind of commute it for him. So. Does that help kind of answer your question a little bit? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Canon. Yes, my apologies uh, for not, uh, but I will do some research. So the next time that is brought up, I will have a more specific answer. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for giving us a call, Aaron from Dallas. And if you are looking to call, we're, we're coming up here on the, the last break for the show today. Uh, but maybe we could pick up on the other side with you giving us a call at 877-511-5483. And remember, you can stream this on Facebook, on Rumble, and on YouTube. We've gotten some questions on YouTube. I hope we have time to answer those for you today. Uh, but thank you for tuning in to Ask a Priest Live. We're chatting with Canon Zignago uh, and answering all of your questions. So whatever you have going on right now, whatever questions you have, any doubts, 
whatever it is, give us a call. We're here for you at 877-511-5483. And hey, maybe download that iCatholic radio app or iCatholic music. You can tune in on all of those devices and we're here waiting for you. Please make sure that you do not touch that dial. You're not gonna wanna miss the last part of this show today. So we will see you coming up here on the other side. And we're looking forward to chatting with you more. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On March 4th, we celebrate the feast of St. Casimir, Confessor. Casimir was born in Krakow in the year of our Lord, 1458, the second son of King Casimir IV and Queen Elizabeth von Habsburg. He was tutored by Poland's first historian, Father Johannes Longinus, and from an early age was a beacon of piety in the Polish court. Casimir's deep devotion to the Blessed Mother is exemplified by the hymn Omni Die Dic Mariae, or Daily, Daily Sing to Mary, a copy of which was buried with him at his request. Though likely composed earlier, it is known to this day as the hymn of St. Casimir. When the prince was 15, his father attempted to place him on the throne of Hungary, aided by discontented Hungarian nobles. Casimir assented, but reluctantly, and gladly turned back when it was learned that the Pope opposed the plan and the Hungarian claimant had amassed greater support. Prince Casimir lived out the rest of his life in fervent practice of the faith, maintaining perfect chastity and refusing marriage. He died of a lung affliction at the young age of 23 and was soon hailed as a saint and a patron of Poland, Lithuania, and the youth. Also celebrated on this day are Pope St. Lucius I, St. Owen, St. Giovanni Antonio Farina, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Hi, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. Join us for the spirit world on the Station of the Cross. Don't be laying hands on people and definitely don't be giving commands in the name of Jesus, leave so-and-so. So what can we say if we feel like there is demonic activity? What can we do? The sacramental graces of baptism, confession, and the mass remove the vast majority of demonic problems outside of possession. The spirit world every Saturday at 11 a.m. right here on the Station of the Cross. Enjoying the show? Catch up on podcasts of past episodes on your favorite platform. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, TuneIn, and the free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Welcome back to Ask a Priest Live. You know, before we hit the break, I mentioned that we're on iCatholic Radio app and an iCatholic Music app. And if you are listening right now on either of those, if you're listening on iCatholic Radio app or you like the iCatholic Music app, please give us a five-star review. Um, between that and even if you're watching live on YouTube, make sure you give us a thumbs up, subscribe, do all of the things, smash that like button. We just... Whatever you can do, if you like this show, um, it really helps us a lot to boost this show and the algorithm, make sure more people find this amazing, uh, this amazing station. Uh, I, I have to say, it's been a pleasure to be joining you guys on the Station of the Cross because uh, there just aren't enough Catholic radio stations like this one. So uh, here we are today for Ask a Priest Live with Canon Zignago, and he's answering your questions. And so uh, I'm excited about this next question because I think a lot of people we're they're kind of wondering what it is that we're talking about when we're when we're praying the Lord's Prayer. So live on YouTube, Rich, thank you for asking this question. He asks us, why in the Lord's Prayer does it specifically say, and lead us not into temptation when the Heavenly Father would never lead us into temptation? I think a lot of people get confused about this point. So how can we clear this question up for people? Yes, the wording can seem um, a little confusing, uh, although that has been the wording that the church has uh, used from time immemorial in, in Latin and the Vulgate, it's et neno sinducas, and so it's really, don't, do not lead us into temptation. But of course, uh, what we're asking is not that God uh, leads us into temptation, but allows us to fall in moments of temptation, right? Because God doesn't bring temptation upon us, rather temptation is simply 
kind of a part of our lives, especially since the fall, but not even, you know, but even before the devil came and tempted Adam and Eve through, um, uh, through disobedience, uh, through the temptation of disobedience and pride. And so temptation is, is part uh, of who we are because we have free will. We can choose what is good. We can choose what is bad. And the occasion, the, uh, pro the sort of, uh, uh, propensity or rather um, pull towards choosing what is evil uh, is exactly that temptation. So we ask God specifically, and I think most people understand naturally what is meant here, uh, let us not fall in times of temptation. Let us not be led into temptations that are too strong for us. Let us not um, uh, be attached to temptation, uh, but rather vanquish it uh, through humility, through prayer, through God's grace, uh, and through his strength. So I think that, you know, fundamentally, most people understand what is meant by that. And simply because those words are used in, in Duco, uh, lead us into, um, we, we, we may misunderstand uh, kind of our relationship with that. God is not seeking out the temptation, but he allows temptation to come to us so that we might be tried. And we simply ask that those temptations not be too strong or overwhelming, uh, that he lead us with also his grace. Excellent, excellent uh, answer for us there. So we have another live YouTube question. We have some very active viewers here on YouTube. Uh, so the next question is, is being asked by Ed on YouTube. What is the significance of the priest's Beretta? It has four sides, but only three points on top. Why is that? You guys wear funny hats. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do wear, wear funny hats. Uh, well, the reason I wear it is because that's what's been done uh, for a long time. It's a priestly, uh, priestly hat. But uh, I think, you know, as far as the specific historical context goes, I'm not entirely sure. I do know that um, uh, the four-corned hat was worn by judges and magistrates, and so the priests have the three-corned hat, or three uh uh, three um, with the three uh, bumps on it, the three fins on it. And, you know, the reason that is given is, you know, three in honor of the Holy Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three on one, the Holy Trinity uh, should be um, our ruler, our guide, our leader, all of our thoughts and actions should emanate from and lead us towards the most Holy Trinity. And so that is why there are those three points there. Um, and uh, the three sim sim symb symbolizes, of course, the most blessed Trinity. So that's uh, the symbolic reason. And the historical reason is, uh, well, men would wear hats as a sign of authority. And so the priest's hat is the Beretta, the sign of his authority. He is, you know, also the only man who wears a hat in the church, well, with the exception, of course, of the of the bishop, right? Uh, because he has the authority there, but he never wears it, you know, at top at the top of the altar, but rather only when he's facing the people, when he's preaching, it's a sign of his authority with regards or his holding the place of Christ with regard, regards to the people. So that's why he wears it also processing in and out when he's among the people, because he is their leader in a certain sense. He is, he represents Christ among them. That is I mean, I, I've never even really thought to ask that question. And I'm really glad that you explained that. That's just so, I just love that. There's so much symbolism in our faith. And it's like every detail is so exact and beautiful and intentional. And it's just one of the things I love about being a Catholic. Um, so another another live YouTube comment question comes from Julie. And we're going back to our question just a couple questions ago about the Lord's Prayer, but she actually says, speaking of the Lord's Prayer, why does the Novus Ordo insist that people stand when Jesus personally kneeled in the garden when he prayed it? Um, why wouldn't we follow his example by kneeling while we pray that in the Novus Ordo? Do you, do you know why that changed or what that shift is? Uh, so uh when she refers to knelt in the in the garden and prayed it because he's prayed not my will but thine be done um specifically and he prayed to the father mm -hmm. i think she's referring to of course when our lord gave us the specific words of the our fathers on the sermon on the mount um uh, with uh in, in in earlier in the gospel of matthew so there she's kind of extrapolating and saying he prayed it in the the garden which i mean he did address his father in the garden he asked that this chalice be removed and then he said nevertheless not my will but thine be done uh so uh, specifically well traditionally um the our father 
I think was prayed uh, standing. Uh, the priest certainly prays it standing. Of course, he's standing for most of the mass, um, and the faithful uh, would stand as well. Now there are no rubrics for the faithful in the traditional mass, so, the, so standing, kneeling, you know, uh, it kind of depends. At certain masses, the choir, so the uh, not the choir singing in the choir loft, but rather the priests who constitute the the choir. Uh, if there were priests or clerics assisting at mass uh, right near the altar, they would. Uh, stand at a sung mass for the Our Father, also I think at a low mass, but then they would stay kneeling if it was a uh, requiem mass um, or a penitential uh, time mass uh, uh, as well on a, on a feria or during Lent, uh, they would stay kneeling. So it kind of depends on the season, actually, if you look at it traditionally. So you know, there is an understanding for standing and that we're all invoking our, our, our common father at the same time uh, through the mouth of the priest who prays it. Uh, and then there's also an understanding of, okay, during the penitential times, we remain kneeling so that we might be heard. So I think that, you know, I would, I would just do what the rest of the, the people are doing or what your priest kind of directs you to do, uh, standing or kneeling. It, it kind of depends. The main thing is that you pray uh, the words of the prayer well, um, you know, focusing more on the uh, uh, the particular tenets and uh, utterances and and words that you're saying rather than um, the posture, which I'm not denying is important, but it seems to me that it kind of, you know, kind of doing what the other people are doing, kneeling or standing, depending on the time of the of the year, both are, both are acceptable. And the fact that you stand during the Our Father isn't necessarily only the Novus Ordo. That's also traditional uh, in the sense of uh, being being done at the Latin Mass, especially on Sundays. Mm, that's really great to know because, yeah, there are a lot of differences between the two, obviously, but we just don't always know enough to to... I don't know, know why these things, why we're doing what we're doing. So thank you so much for clearing that up today and for sitting down with me and answering these questions for our, for every single person that called in here. These were great, great questions. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we'll be back tomorrow. I'll be back here uh, hosting another another show on Ask a Priest Live. I'm really excited to sit down with Father John Mary Bolin tomorrow, and we'll see you then. Are you looking for a way to protect unborn lives while juggling a busy schedule?